Joe Tech, you ready? I'm going to give you a countdown. Three, two, and action. Hello, 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 hello. It's your girl, Georgette, a.k.a. The Freaker. And I am super excited because today I am doing something a little different. I am having a round table, real talk with some real women. And so... Today, I want you guys to sit back, relax, and get ready for some real talk. We're calling this Nourishment for the Soul in more ways than one. And so, y'all get ready, because this, I, I don't even know, I don't even know what it's going to be, but we're about to find out. So, I am going to let these wonderful women introduce themselves. Actually, hold up, before we do that, y'all know your girl, Georgia, aka the preacher, always prays first before we do anything. So, let me go ahead, get a word of prayer, and, and then I am going to let my amazing women introduce themselves, and then we're going to get into some real talk. So, here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come right now, first and foremost, just thanking you, God, thanking you for this day, this hour, this opportunity. Lord, may you reign over this conversation, God. Lord, let us be open, honest, transparent, Father God. Lord, let us laugh, Lord God. Let us have a gut-wrenching laughter time, edifying, magnifying your name, Lord God, so that this will help someone. One person, Lord God, if it's only one, Lord God, we will be satisfied. I thank you, God, for the production. May you bless Randall, Angela, all of that they do. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, ladies, so I know I have set y'all up. <laughs> y'all have no idea what's going on, but it's going to be good. So I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourselves. Tell us whatever you want about yourselves, something maybe that someone doesn't know, whatever it is that you want to share. So I'm going to start with Q. Go ahead, Q. All right. Well, um, so my name is Kawana, but I go by Q. I prefer Q. Um, and I think we've been friends for about five years now. Mm -hmm. um, been a wonderful ride, so thank you for that. Uh, I'll talk to you later about this, this spontaneity that you throw on me, as you know. <laughs> How I feel about that, but it's all good. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, just like Georgette. Um, I'm a survivor, thriver, and um, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to talk today. Yeah, she's definitely a survivor. We probably get into that a little bit too. So, and in the middle, we have none other than my mother, who really didn't know anything about this. So. Just give us your name, whatever you want to share. My name is Eva Williams. I'm very proud to be here, be a part of this. And my daughter surprised me just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. so we're going to let God lead us, and we're going to do the best we can. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Missy. Um, my, well, my name is Celestine Carter. And um, you can call me Missy. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C. And um, this is a surprise to me. I got up maybe about an hour ago. Yes. And my husband and I were preparing for breakfast. I said, oh, it looks so nice outside, nice and rain to stay in. Then <laughs> I got a call. Yes. But, um, it's still good, guys. The, um, I'm a uh, former pastor of a New Hope Praise Ministry. My husband is the apostle. Ooh. And uh, we love the Lord. We love the Lord in the ministry over 35 years. Ooh, and so God is good. Yes, he through is. All, through all that we've had to experience, God yes. is still good. Yes, he is. Oh, this is good. I didn't even know that. Ooh. Yes. All right. So let me just give you a, a little bit of background on, um, and I shared this with the ladies a few minutes ago before we started, but I'll share with the audience on um, this is all about nourishment, and I, I call this nourishing the soul in more ways than one. And when you think about the word nourish, you think about food, right? And you think about eating. And actually, I'm a lover of words, and so I'm going to give you the definition of nourish and what it says, because I looked it up just to make sure that this was going to be fitting for what I wanted to do. 
And so nourish, it says, provide with food or other substances necessary for growth, health, and good condition. So that's one definition. And then it also says, enhance the fertility of. And I was like, wow. Like, so when I thought about this and when I came up with the name, nourish the soul in more ways than one. And I thought about how we nourish people, how I nourish people. I love to cook. I love to feed people. I love to serve people. And with everything that has gone on in the past couple of years with the pandemic and people being shut in, and we really had to realize what was important, right? And how family and food and just being together with people and when we've been isolated for so long, I was like, what can I do? And, and, and it just came up and I was talking to Q actually, we were having a brainstorming session and this is how we got here. And I said that I wanted to do something different to be able to nourish people's soul, not only by breaking bread with them, but like this definition says, to give them a substance necessary for growth and for health in good condition. And so that's all we're going to do today. We're just going chit chat. I'm, I'm telling y'all, I don't have no questions. We're going to let God lead us. I do have some topics that I thought about that God laid on my heart. And so that's why I started laughing when Miss C said that she was in the church because the church is one of the topics that I want to talk about. And so let me give you all the five topics that I came up I kind of lumped this first one. It's three things, but I think they all kind of go together. Sex. Love and marriage. That's topic number one. Children. I don't know, Missy. Do you have any children? Yes. Okay, perfect. The church. Money. And then we're just going to round it up, end it up. We're just talking about us women. So, so I'm just going to, when you hear the words sex, love, and marriage, what does that bring to mind? And so, Guys, let me give you a little caveat too. So we were supposed to have Nourish the Soul. This first one was supposed to be down through the decades. And we were going to have the different decades represented here. But life happens and we weren't able to do that. And so we don't make it work. So Q, and, and I don't know, do you ladies mind giving your age? No? Okay. So when you, I just want you to give us your age. But... What comes to mind, we're going to start with you because she's our, 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 our baby here on the ladies on the table. <laughs> um, but when you hear those words, what comes to mind? You start with your age and then we'll go from there. Well, 44. Okay. Um, wow. Well, I'll start off by saying that I was married for 23 years. And... In that time, if you asked me that question, I probably would have said that they kind of all went together. But now that I'm no longer married and I've had time to really process it, I actually think they're three different entities. Um, love is an action. You choose to love in spite of. Um, sex is a very complex very deep, we could probably be just on that topic alone, we could be here all day, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the current state of life that I'm in right now, um, sex to me means vulnerability. Mm. It means emotional nakedness. And as a woman, what I learned is that we've never really given ourselves permission to enjoy sex, to be open and vulnerable with sex, mm -hmm. to be honest about sex. Um, and I think that it would be very helpful for younger women to know that they deserve the exact same level of care with sex that men, men give themselves permission to have. Mm. They give themselves permission to have it, but we don't. Um, marriage is partnership. Marriage is um, respect and friendship first, or at least it should be. Uh, I, I used to believe that you had to be on the same path in order for it to be successful. 
I don't necessarily believe that anymore. What I believe is that there has to be respect in friendship and communication and transparency, even in the midst of two people growing in different directions. I think a relationship can be successful with people growing in different directions because it doesn't mean that they're growing out of the marriage. Um, even though we're one in the eyes of God, like in marriage, right? And the Bible speaks on that. At the end of the day, we're human and we're all individuals. And so we're going to always be individual, even in marriage. Um, marriage is hard. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it 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 hard. It is hard. And you are not the same person, and neither is your spouse. You, well, however you get to the end of the marriage, whether it's so that you part or you say, I'm out, right? You're not the same person that you were when you got married. And I think people forget that. Um, we hold on to this, this unrealistic vision of our partner through the journey of marriage. And these are all things that I really kind of came to the, ah, like to get off after my marriage was over. Um, and, and for, for me, it was really about taking stock in myself and analyzing myself through the journey, not so much of my partner or um, like what went it wrong. It was really more of what did I not know, what was I not taught, and what was I, what did I not have time to learn while I was in the midst of it. And now that all of those things are gone, like how can I reflect on really what I think marriage feels like from my perspective? Or it doesn't mean that the marriage would have still not ended, it just means that I had an opportunity to really think about these three things in particular. So it's interesting to be about those three things. I've never been able to actually share these these thoughts, by the way. So I should have known you were going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't see. I, I mean, you, I heard you. You, you, you said, said something. Yeah, she, <laughs> said, she set up a little bit. I'm very observant now. Watch. So, so we, let's start, start with your age. Okay. I'm, so, I'm so thankful that these women are willing to share their age. But let's start, let's start with your age. And um, when you want to add or throw in the, in the pile on this. Um, okay. okay, I'm 73 years old. And I, I love my age. Because God gave me that. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And, and I'm saying that. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about it first. Okay. okay. Um, when I was um, tw turning 25, I thought that was really old. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> and, um, my husband knew how depressed I was. Wow. Because I said, I'm turning 25. And so he would always take me on a little trip on my vacation. So we were going up to. Um, Chandler Mountains, you know, and we had a car that was dying, but he wanted to please me. And so we uh, went up to the mountains, and then the, mountain, the uh, car overheated. Wow. And we pulled over into the parking space. And um, I'm still feeling the press. He said, stay in the car while I do this, while I fix the car. Mm -hmm. He opened up the hood, and I got out of the car. And um, as soon as I got out of the car, the, the heater, the top flew off of the, um, mm -hmm. and it hit my face. Mm -hmm. It oh burned in my face. I mean, I ran as far as I could to get away from the scene, but the scene like was following me. And there was a hospital right down here, uh, and my face was black. And I said, Lord, I will never complain about my age again. That's what I'm proud to yes. be. Every day is a blessing. I love yes. it. It's so, a blessing. Yes. So, okay. Yes. <laughs> well, thank God. Yes. 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 So, um, marriage is um, a wonderful blessing for those who want to be married. Um, I, 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 my mother called the divorce early, um, and I did not know what marriage was going to be like. I had no idea. Um, here's another story. I was living with my mother. I ran away from my father who loved me. He raised me. And I went to live with my mother, which was just fighting and arguing all the time with her and her boyfriend. And um, I left out of the house because I was forced to be Cinderella. With two younger children by my mother's boyfriend. 
And it was, it was hard on me. My father was wonderful, and I didn't realize it. I was a young girl. And so um, when I left the house, because um, I was told, go to the store to get some ice cream for this man that she loved. And I hated him, long story short. I said, I will never come back to this house again. I started walking down the street. And actually, I was so young, and I was ready to commit suicide. That's how bad it was. As I, drove, as I walked down the street, the car drove on the side. And it was a man who says, hey, I like those legs. <laughs> and, uh -oh. just, and all of a sudden, I looked around, and there was somebody who said, yellow Corvette, two guys. And he said, um, can I speak with you? And so they pulled up on the side. I've never done anything like this, because my father raised me as a church girl. Got out, he got out the car. And I hate to say this, but... He gave me a little kiss and got back in the car and left. I said, oh, I'm so embarrassed. What did I do? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the housing, and got a housing, and I lived there for like 
three years, and then one day a man knocked on the door. And I said, what is this man doing at my door? He said, listen, I'm coming to evict you because your rent hasn't been paid in three years. Now I'm sitting there with four babies not knowing what to do. And then he said, come down to the office. He said, I'm not going to put the sign on your door. Come down to the office. So I went down to the office with my four babies. When I walked in, that lady said, we cannot put you out. We cannot put you out. And I cried and I cried. And my dad was my savior. I called my dad and I said, Dad, they put me out with these four babies. He said, no, something's going to come through. So I got my first home by myself on Matthew Street with four babies. By then, I was two blocks from jumping out of the second floor window because I did not know how to raise these four babies by myself. And so one day, Man walked by and he was standing by the window. So he came in my house, came upstairs, he said, That's not the way. Jennifer mm -hmm. was all sitting on the couch. He said, What's going to happen to them? I said, They're on their own. I can't take it no longer. So he called DHS. Mm -hmm. DHS came out and they made a appointment for me to go see the psychiatrist. And they next door would watch them. They gentlemen was sitting on that couch. I rode all the way to the end of the Allegheny, uh, Germantown Avenue. And gentlemen was sitting there, and Miss Betty would look through the window at my babies, and they sat there the whole time. And I lived on Matthew Street, so just imagine how far I had to go back. I would ride up and down, and I went, and I got therapy and everything, and I got myself together. And then I said, Lord, help me. I couldn't afford the house because back then he didn't need it that much. So I applied and I went back to the house and on the third on D4. And the time the elevator wasn't working and stuff. And when my kids was old enough to go to school, I went to a double R school with my four kids. And Jen was a coach. She was a baby. And Eugene Stroh became into my life. He was my first white father. And he said, I'm going to give you a job. I said, give me a job. I said, I'm going to educate. He said, we will teach you. And they did. I had no skills on the computer. I had no skills of any kind. So, because just realized I was 13 when I got pregnant, so I wasn't going to school. They told me how to answer the phone. They told me how to work the computer. They told me how to take attendance. They told me how to take care of my children. But as my children matured, they put my children in the best schools that you could get. They went to the schools with no walls. And they went to um, schools that girls had never been to Edison. They put my two girls to Edison. Georgia went to a private school. And I'm talking about I had to pay no money. And my principal, he would swap papers with different schools to get them in the paint into the different schools. So um, as I sat there, the teachers matured me more and more and more because I wore a black rag on my head, long dresses down there, and walked on the back of my shoes. I ain't telling the story. And when the Burns and Shirley Sneakers came out, I thought that was the best thing in the world. Because I got them at the grocery store and they was on like a dollar a year. I didn't tell you I made sure my kids gave me a buck and the shoe store, the very expensive shoe stores. Because back then they would give you vouchers to get your kids shoes. So they wore the best. And the teachers at the school told me how to sew. I would make their clothes at Easter time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have that expensive. Lord Jesus. I am. Um, I am. Um, I'm, I'm just so glad that God came into my life one day when my dad died. And I had no dependent of the, you know, the push me through. And I was a small kid because I could tell my dad I want a ham. He would come and throw it on the porch or throw it on the step. And I said, I want a pie. He would bring that to me. But when my dad that I almost lost my mind. But God had a minister right across the street. And I would go there every day for the therapy. And he said, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. But my dad, George, and all my kids grow, you know, but just losing my dad was just too much for me. And he brought me through. He brought me through. And I would cry all the time. And then he sent a man in my life who swore me more than my dad. Then he died. And I said, God, what am I doing? But what it was, this man was taking me from the church.
And then we would go sit in the car and be drinking and stuff. So God had to take him out. But I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Because my oldest son and that one right here, they cannot be doing enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, not, I don't care if I call them and say, I think I want to say, she's my only little No, know, but she keeps me in tap. She don't let me run wild. And if I say she she says, she's a lot of You know what I mean. Uh -huh. But every, every time, time she goes to a different place, she sends for me. And every, every time, time when she went to uh, um, Texas, I, I, I think I went to Texas three or four times, times. She, she took me across the border. When, when she uh, was married, I, I was the best. So my son took me to Germany. I had been in more places in Florida and stuff. And when I tell people I have traveled, they think, you know, when I'm okay, when I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Well, she even touched on children a little bit, and then she even touched on children. I want you to talk about your marriage. But it's okay. We can go away. Let me say so. I am 52. Yes, 52. And. I have, I have to share the funny story. story. So, so the, 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 the thing I remember about marriage and <laughs> my mom and my dad um, was the police pulling up mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in the middle of our block because my mom and dad had been fighting and my mom broke my dad's arm. Because okay? my dad was not the man that he should have been. Okay, so let's go quick like that. God rest his soul because we're over here. Um, and growing up, marriage for me was, I had no idea what it looked like, what it was supposed to be, none of that. Because my dad used to take me to visit his girlfriends and tell them that they were, his, they were my aunts. So I had no idea what marriage was, what it meant, what it looked like. None, None of those, those things. things. Um, and, and so, so I wound up as well, well getting married very young at 17 years old. old. Um, and it's just to the reason that, that I started unpacking. Why did I get married, married at 17? Because who does that in my time? Right? Mm -hmm. right? right? No, no one does that. And it's so funny because, because whenever I would go places, places and tell people, people I was married, married the first question, question they would ask, well, how old is your kid? kid? How old is your child? Are you and I'm like, I don't have any kids. kids. And they're like, but you're married and you're 17. And so marriage to me, um, it took a lot for me to really understand what marriage, sex, and love is. I'm on the second marriage now, and my husband, Michael, was created just for me. <laughs> because I'm a whole lot. Um, and I'm still unhappy with marriage, sex, and love. Because as people, we grow, right? That's what this whole thing is about. We grow, we change as we mature, as we go through things, as we deal with situations, as our life changes, and as the world alters. So I now know that... Um, Marriage is definitely, I don't even say 50-50, like, like it's a thousand thousand, right? Like, like you got to come in with a thousand, I got to come in with a thousand, and we got to make this thing work out. And so that is what it's all about for me. And I'm so grateful, as Ms. said, and I'm so thankful that God has given me the opportunity to have a husband now that was created just for me. And so... We will be celebrating 24 years this year in May, and so it's been an amazing journey, and I'm looking forward to even more. So, so I'm going to kind of touch on um, the, the church. I think this is a good because now as I am, as I said, I've been unpacking for the last couple of years. Like, why did you get married at 17? Like, what, what prompted that? Because it wasn't. I wasn't, I wasn't pregnant, I wasn't, I wasn't you know, know I, I didn't have to get married. And I had my whole life, like, like I was going to go to Howard University, study law, law and become, become a judge. judge. Like, like, that, that was, was what I said I was going to do from the time I was in elementary school. school. Like, that, that was what I wanted, wanted to do. do. And so, what happened? What happened, Georgia? Like, like, why did you? And as I'm unpacking these things, things now, a lot of it had to do with the church. Because I was in church. 
I was in church, church every Sunday with my grandparents. Um, at that time, my mom was not going to church when I started going to church. Um, but but she, she made sure, sure her children were in church, right? So, you know, she had that foundation, and she knew I needed that foundation. And so, as I'm unpacking things now, like I said, I think a lot of it was the church and what I was taught in church and how they taught about marriage. And like I just said, I didn't know, I didn't have anything to look up to, so I'm looking at the church to teach me. And, and what, what did they, they tell you? You can't have sex. You can't have sex when you're married. You want to hell. You know, you want to be condemned to hell, right? And so I think a lot of that played into why I thought I had to get married to this man at 17. Because I didn't want to go to hell. I just did not. And we did. We had sex before we got married. And I thought, I have to marry him. Because if not, I'm going to go to hell. And that altered a whole lot of things in my life. And so... Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about that, like the, the church and in, in marriage or the church and anything that, that it may have caused you to do something that you're now thinking about, like, did I really have to do that? Or, you know, why did I make this decision? And so let's kind of talk about that. And I want to start with Missy on this one since she is... <laughs> We found out that they're pastors and that they've been in the church. So how long have you guys been in the church? Um, oh, my life. Okay. okay. Oh, my my father raised me okay. with uh, my other uh, two sisters and brothers. Brother. And uh, he put us in the church and he would send us to church. No, he would send us to Sunday school and give us money to put in Sunday school and we would go to the candy store and spend that money. <laughs> That's true. And um, then he would come to church. He would lead us at the church. And so that's what that's the way I was raised. And uh, my mother was not in my life when I was younger. So I didn't really know her like I wanted to. But um, I was raised in the church and, and I, you know, her same thing, and I was afraid of the Holy Ghost because they call it ghost instead of spirit. Right. And she had older, they started calling it wow. spirit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I never knew um, that I would be a pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. um, his father was pastor. Okay. And um, it's just the leading of God. That's how God leads you. You, know? mm -hmm. you pray and he blesses you. You know the way you need to be blessed. Mm -hmm. And in everything that I went through, um, I thought about, you know, God, what's this all about? You know? mm -hmm. And then thank you, Lord, for saving my life. And so everything I did, I refer back to what I learned in church mm -hmm. and, and what I read in the Bible. And my father told me I had to read um, the Bible a chapter every morning before going to school. Mm -hmm. um, I said, Daddy, I don't understand it. He said, read it anyway. And so I would read it, you know, and, and I got something out of the stories, but, you know, I didn't really understand everything. But church was uh, very pivotal in my life. Um, my grandmother um, was a holiness, you know, um, and she, she loved church, but um, I, I grew to understand that there's different levels. You make mistakes, you grow. You make another mistake, you grow. Um, you, you seem to grow stronger when you're in your valley. You, you're happy when you're up on the mountain. Yes. But that valley thing makes you talk to God more. And it makes you want more from the Lord. Yes. You know, and, 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 and the Lord gives you things. You know, like when you read in your Bible and, and then you come to an understanding of what's going on and then something comes to you and says, oh, that's what I was reading the other day. Now I understand. And so it's all about understanding and growing in, in the Lord. And so there are different levels, like they say, different levels, different levels. Yes. 
It's, it's, it's part of the living. It's, it's a part of the life, you know. Yeah. But you go and you understand. And, and you learn to love people who hate you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody's not going to love you because you're a child of God. You know, a lot of jealousy. You know, a lot of hatred for whatever reason. You may look like somebody that you don't like. So you're targeted, you know. Mm. But the thing is, God taught me how to, it's still teaching me how to love those who don't like you. Mm. You know, to, to pray for them. I learned to pray for people who I may have an issue with or may have an issue with me. And I pray for my supervisors and I see a change in them. Mm. When I walk into my job, I pray when I step into the door because I don't know what's going to happen. Yes. I pray for the patients that I talk to on the phone. I'm not supposed to be making appointments and I'm talking to them on the phone about God. And then they want to talk some more. And this is what God has taught me in church. People need you. You don't know who needs you. Yes. But everybody that the Lord brings before you is for a reason. That's right. And it makes you strong. The church makes you strong. Strong either way.
my childhood trying to be accepted by this organization, this congregation mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. And um, and as a little girl, I was very aware of how hard she worked to be a part of this organization mm -hmm. and how they let, let her join, they let her come to, you know, to the congregational stuff, they let her participate, but, but they would never baptize her as their mm -hmm. mother's witness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know I remember as a little girl going to the sleepovers and just not feeling like I was being accepted by even the little girls in wow. this group. Um, she, she she managed, managed to, to make some, some really close friends, very small group of them, and then, you know, one of the ladies passed away from a brain tumor, and then her connection of friendship in, in this religion kind of died with that. Mm -hmm. But she chased that for years. Wow. So fast forward, her time is two more children. Mm -hmm. My brother was a year younger than me, my sister was a ten year younger than me. And I remember her getting this all up and being dragged to the King Hall and all these conferences and she'd spend money that we could afford to travel us to these, these conferences and yet she still hadn't been invited and has been baptized, right? I'll never forget my brother. My brother is probably the most vocal to my mother out of the three of us. Um, and I just kind of remember him just like, you know, I'm not going to feel a religion. And it's because of what we were exposed to growing up. Yeah, right. um, my sister's just kind of quiet and she's just like, it's whatever. And me, I've got an opinion, but if you don't ask me for it, I'm not going to get to it. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I never really quite like, share my opinion with my mom about it. But I remember one day my mom kind of, not just a little upset, and my brother was just like, you know, do you, but because of what you exposed us to, you did it like we weren't accepted. And if that's what religion is about, and that's what, you know, God is about, I don't want a part of that. Mm -hmm. And when she brought that to me, I, I had to have this very, what we call fierce conversation. I like these work fierce conversations. I like to say, you know, conversation. I like to say fierce conversation. And then I just had to say, you know, mom. Um, I, I kind of don't understand how he got to that place. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. And I had to share some examples with her about what we were supposed to do growing up. And I even had a reminder, like, do you remember when we were homeless, like, sleeping in a car homeless in the middle of winter, or from the back of your work building? Mm -hmm. We had to actually pick up cigarette smoking so that you could come out start a car and work with the car so that we wouldn't freeze to death out there. And if you were part of this congregation, wow. did it show up for us? This, this is, is why he feels that way. Mm -hmm. This is, and, 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 and we, we all feel, feel that way. We just, we just not spoken on it. Yeah, yeah. However, with all of that, I made a conscious decision a long time ago that my relationship with God is personal, and um, and even though I haven't really enjoyed the journey as a child, I wouldn't let it deter me from creating journey and finding my own journey. Yes. And so as a mother, um, what I chose to do was not really throw religion on my kids, but like expose them to it anyway, mm -hmm. right? And so especially when things were really rough at home, um, we would get dressed and we'd go to church. And because that made me feel better, and then I would just ask them from a teacher educational standpoint, like, what would you do another day? And tell them, like, you're, you know, and then right. when they got to a certain age, the conversations kind of shifted to, I respect whatever journey, the religious journey you choose, because I wasn't given the freedom to, to do the same, and I'm very, I was very traumatized, so I'm not really the one to, to say, this is where you need to go, this is the religion you need to choose, yes. um, because, I, because I, I'm still working through my stuff. Mm -hmm. And my children really respected that I allowed them to do that. Um, yes. When I did choose to get married, though, my former mother-in-law also kind of re-traumatized me. Um, I was forced to actually get married in the church that my ex-husband grew up in because his grandmother was the like mother of the church. So I was forced, um, and I was forced to walk down the aisle, and I was forced to, um, like it wasn't my wedding, it was the church's wedding and her wedding, and the 
first time I actually went to church with that family, family as a girlfriend, and it was winter, winter. like winter, winter, winter snow, snow to your kids, kids winter, winter, and I had on dress pants, pants. and you, you would have thought that, that I was the devil. devil. <laughs> <laughs> you you would have thought, thought, thought I was the devil. devil. Wow. And, and, and and that that, that I did something that triggered me. That was a trigger for me. That. You know, you know I, it was, was just, just like, you know, well, he, he was, was raised, raised in the church, church, and I was like, you know what, you might not like the church, church I was raised in, but I was actually raised, raised in the church, church too, like, like so, so what is, what am I saying, you know, you know? Mm. So, so at 19, 19 years old, so, this is how I was being invited in to this family, and, you know, I, I, one, one of the one of the issues of this for a really long time, because I always wanted to renew our house, and I wanted to do I wanted, I wanted to do a wedding. wedding. I, I didn't, didn't want those, those memories, memories anymore. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do a wedding. It never happened. It was always like dismissed. And, and I thought once we hit 10 years of marriage, I was like, just never mind. mind. Because at this point, I don't even remember being married. Like, 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 this, this, this person is like, 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 you know, you know, my relationship, relationship with God, God has really been a personal one because mm -hmm. I have been through so much. Mm -hmm. I know that there is God, and I know He's been sitting right next to me because mm -hmm. I've been through some stuff. Mm -hmm. You know that yes. I've been through some stuff. I've been, been through, through so, through so many, many things that most people would not have survived. Mm -hmm. And so when, when people are like, how did, did you get through this? There's absolutely no shadow of doubt that there is God and that He's been in my life this whole time, even then. I wasn't educated, educated the way, way most people are educated, educated on, on God and religion. religion. So, mm -hmm. But I got married because I wanted to be married. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. awesome. I mean, and I, I, you know, I, I guess as I am, you know, you know unpacking and going back and going, going back, back to that time, and really, because, you know, when, when things, things happen, we, we, we shut it down, right? Now. We, we, we close that trauma out and we don't want to relive it, but we have to because if we want to grow, right? Just how we're here. If we want to grow, if we want to really nourish our soul, like we said, more than just food. We have to find ourselves going back and wondering why. Uh oh. That's me and I'm sorry, y'all. You know why? And it's prayer time. time. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and, and it doesn't mean when to go home. Okay, here we go. I, I usually pray every day at 11 o'clock. That's a reminder. Um, but, but we, we have, have to, in order to, to, to move forward and, and to nourish our soul, we have, have to go back to those traumas. traumas. And, and we have, have to go back. And I think now church is such a pivotal um thing right, right now because, because of everything, everything that has happened, happened right and everything that has, has gone on and church, church has been at the foundation of everything that i've done, done. I'm, I'm not going to say um i mean because i had a choice too, too right to, to, to get married but i'm still unpacking that but, but i know that that was a big part of that i'm not going to blame the church because i'm not but at the same time i know that it impacted the decisions that i made when I was 17, and so now at 52, where, you know, Georgia is like, why? And so it's a part of it, but I'm not blaming the church. But I think that the church has um, has fallen short in a lot of areas, you know, and it's not perfect, right? There's nothing perfect. But how do we now um, talk about it? And have these conversations and bring them up, be open and honest and transparent and share our stories and our past and the things that happened, the traumas that have happened in the church. Because a lot of people now won't even go to church because of the traumas that they have had, right? And so we are the church, though, as well. So I have to be open and honest and transparent about what I've been through, with you, with you, with you, because when we do meet those people who will never step foot in the church. There will be some people who will never right. step foot in the church, right? That's just being 100. They will never step foot in the church. But if they need a Georgia, or if they need a Cuba, or if they need a Eva, or if they need a Nessie, who's open and honest and say, yes, this is your church hurt. I had church hurt too, sis. But let me tell you, 
what it's really about because we are the church, but more importantly, it's about God. It is at the top. So we can take all of that and we can build with that. And I, I can't tell you whether it's a step of the church or not. I can't do that. But what I can tell you is how good God is and what he's done for me and why I love him so much. And through it all, I can still depend on him. And so... And, and look at Jesus. Look at what Jesus had. I mean, look at what he did. Yes. He had no sin. But they, they hated him. They, 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 you know, they did all they could to destroy him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that. And that's still here. It's still here. You know? But we, we we're not going through the hardship that Jesus had to go through. Thank you all for time. We have to, we have to, I have to learn and and I, again, I'm, I'm a rare, I call myself a rare bird sometimes. I'm okay walking into an environment and not, and, and not be worried about whether I'm accepted in that environment. So there were a lot of times that I went to church because I just needed to be moved by the music. I needed to hear the choir. I needed to be spoken to through the choir because I love music. And I was just looking to touch me the most. And then it just so happened the minister or the preacher or the pastor that day was saying something that was monumental that I that felt like he was speaking to me. Then it wonderful, right? I had to take baby steps and just decide and, and I always knew when I needed to be in that space. I mean, you know, and so for me, I didn't care whether someone walked up to me or walked with me. Uh, there were a lot of times as a new person to try to be the up to announce I was a new person. Because I, I won't, that, that wasn't why I was there. Like, and again, it came from the trauma, though, of watching my mom walk into these buildings and not really being involved in it. Except the way, way I was under the impression you're supposed to be even show up church, right? Mm -hmm. And then so I, I, I although I do have trauma from it, I always like to try to look at the other side of it. Maybe the other side of it taught me how to be okay with walking into a room in my authenticity mm -hmm. and not being concerned about whether mm -hmm. someone's mm -hmm. helping me. Mm -hmm. No matter whether it's church or wherever it is, right? Like, I'm okay if no one welcomes me because I'm not here for you. I'm here, I'm here to get so nourished or I'm here to, you know, I'm here for a great purpose. And, and if people happen to, to welcome me, then add a bonus. All right. Absolutely. That's good. Many, many times people come to church for the music. Right. They do. They do. And that's okay. That's okay. Whatever. Whatever you can, it's okay. And I enjoy music. Oh, yeah. That's the love to cry. We love music. Yes, yes. It is a record. Yes. However, we get them there. Because it's funny, you know, you're all thinking, like you said, you think you're coming for one thing and you leave out with something else. Because once you're in the building, God's always going to be. Something's going to drop in your ear. I don't care who you are. It's going to drop in your ear. Yes, one word. One word. One word, you can be in the building and you hear one word. And that's all it takes. It only takes, what do you say, faith of a mustard seed? It don't take a little bit. Only a little bit. But then guess what? If they never walk back in the end, they'll meet one of us along the way that can. Well, like you said, church is in us. God is in us. So you don't even have to go to church to have a relationship with God. You may not realize you have a relationship with God through other people. Right? Yes. That's, that's always the big question. Like, how do you know how to talk to you? That's a whole other It's a lot of ways. It is. It's a lot of ways. So, so I want to touch on just a few things, things and, and we're going to wrap up. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful for your lady. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to do that. I'm sorry. 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 I needed to make sure 
my kids was far in church, I, I started taking them back. But then I went back to my home church, and like she said, it's the bad influence of the people in the church, and when you walk in, you're supposed to be greeted, but they didn't greet me. But I went back because my parents were there. Mm -hmm. All right, and then I got in there, and then when the COVID came, I was going to church four days a week because we were feeding the homeless. And then I gave some of my needs to other people, and I only do it two days a week. But I tell them, when the gas price went up, I couldn't afford to come three days a week. So which day you want me not to come? And they say, please come Wednesdays and Saturdays. I look at it on my phone. But um, God changed my life when I had my operations because I knew I needed him to help me through it. And I think I had like four operations. And my baby come up, my son come up. And um, the last operation, I told him, I said, well, God, I'm just going to lay here and die. And I cried and I cried and then the next day, I just got up and started doing the normal stuff. And you start walking nine blocks and stuff. I said, come on, we got to go with the walker. But God is a big part of my life because I know he can heal your body. He can heal your mind. He can make me not say stuff that my kids don't like. But let me tell you about God. I'm into it to a lot of people. I'm into it. They call me like I got to work when I got kids. And when I get to something that I don't understand, I got people I can call. And they will tell me where it's at or they will write it out for me. So I praise God every day. And sometimes I be in the house with people and my neighbor call me and say, Who with you? I say, The man upstairs. And I, I got out of my car and walked around my car. Because that's what he told me to do. And I just, I love Jesus. I don't know if I'm going to throw it off, but I know Jesus. I know that my grave is about to be at. And I know. And, and this is the first time, the second time in my life, I don't have to worry about paying the bill. Because I'm going to allow Jesus to take 10 cents from here and put 5 cents over here. Then I just, okay, you know, I said, all right, Jesus. But daddy, you know, look at the money you know, Okay, go on, yeah, money you know, you know, you know,
money that's going to have a value to me now because I know I need to save. I need to pay my bills. I need to um, stay on top of stuff. And I got to be on the house. And it's just me and my grandson. And my life's never got cut off. My water, my nothing. You know, and I, I just say, God, girl, I'm in the house. Jesus, oh, God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And my nigga said, Oh, what you? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I am blessed. I don't want nothing. I don't need nothing. My baby gave me a hoopie. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I was out of the elevation. You know, I was in the elevation. But it's not like I can't get in the car. I just praise what people give me. You go to the doctor about me, so you think you gave me $20,000. But I just thank God. I just thank God. And I like to help people. Um, like I said, I grew up with a single mother who worked 
several jobs to keep mm. keep mm. things afloat, mm. and in mm. times we still mm. ended up homeless. Mm. Mm. Even with her working several mm. jobs. Mm. So, so I, I was just the second parent, parent. Um, very early on. So I, I, did, I did not have a childhood. That I, I was born and right into adulthood. Uh, so she had this like, baby at eight years old and I became an adult. Um, when I got married, the very first thing I said at 19 years old to my new husband was, let's sit down and talk about retirement. Let's talk about college savings. Let's talk about... And his response was, you don't need to worry about that right now. And I was like, mm, okay. And as the years went on and on, I find myself just kind of a little just nudge of, hey, let's talk about. And it was just, it, mm -hmm. at this point, there wasn't even a response. It was like, like he didn't hear me. And I'm like, all right, okay. okay. So, when I, as we got older, to our mid 30s, he started working in an environment around people that are much older than him. And he was very starstruck by the lives that these older people had, had been living. And at this point now, even considering that we both grew up with no financial literacy, we made a, we made a very good life uh, together. I will, I will absolutely say that we were home only by the time I was 25, we were alone at our first, our first house because our kids were my children and I grew up in, in our own home. Um, three years later, we ended up buying a second property. You know, we ended up with the property in Las Vegas. So we did well for ourselves. However, if one of us had died, mm. the other one would have been like, oh my God, what do we do? Wow. Right? Um, he he wanted, wanted to keep up with the Joneses. I didn't want to know the Joneses. I didn't want to know the Joneses. What I didn't care about was, was our house. Yeah. And, um, you know, he just, he, he would come home and talk about what his co-workers would have. And in my mind, I'm like, that's, that's great, great, but again, yeah, yeah, I died in our own Right? So, when, when I, I got, got a divorce, you know, people, when, when you get, get a divorce, mm -hmm. um, just like you all know, people will tell you what they think you should do with your yeah. 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 And I'm like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. this, this is what, what I'm going to do. do. Right. I'm, I'm going to get out of there debt free. And I'm, I'm going to only ask for the things that are going to give me the leverage I need later on. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking for things that are relevant. Mm -hmm. I don't want the houses. I want to sell the houses because I already know what the value is in these houses. Right. And I will be blessed with a new house when it's time. Right? Mm -hmm. right? When it's time for me to have my own home, I will get my own home. Now I can fight for a house that has all these memories in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so needless to say, I walked away from my marriage debt free. Um, with a really, really large amount of money, more money than I've ever had in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was make sure that I had a very beefy emergency fund. Mm -hmm. Because before the divorce was final, I had already purchased my first home. So I didn't need the money for my first home. I have already got my first, mm -hmm. my first home, right? Now, now you, you know, know me personally. You know you know my, my journey. journey. You already know. Um, I purchased a new car with the cash. Walked into the dealership and said, "I want that car. Taxes, tags, and title need to be covered. This is an out. No exceptions. I got what I needed, and I walked out the dealership. I do not have a car note. I don't believe in car notes. It is my religion to have a car note." <laughs> Is making sure that I am 
I have financial leverage. It's not about financial freedom, freedom mm. but money, money means leverage. leverage. Wow. Yes. Money, money means leverage. leverage. Right. right. So, so for protecting, protecting my credit score at all costs because, because that's, that's leverage. leverage. Having a great emergency fund because that's leverage. Yeah. You know, not ever having to ask for anything mm -hmm. if I have the leverage. Mm -hmm. It is not about leaving millions behind when I die to my children. I'm going to leave something for them to have leverage, right? Mm -hmm. And anything that I decided to purchase from this point on in my life has to make sense and has to have value. Value meaning if I left it behind and my children were mine and they needed to sell it, it has resale value. I don't purchase anything that does not have resale value. You know what I mean? Um, or if I'm in the kitchen and I need to sell something, it has resale value. You know, I think it's like literally going back to the drawing board and starting from the beginning and thinking about what are, what's most important. And a lot of the things that uh, in my 20s and 30s through my marriage that we did weren't really didn't hold any substance or value. One of the things that I discovered when I went to the pawn shop to sell all the stuff you bought me all those years, not a thing value. I tried to throw any shade and do that. It was nice and thank you for the gifts and everything. However, that was the biggest lesson that I learned when I went to the pawn shop because I mean, I didn't want the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But it held no value. So mm -hmm. I know that if I buy myself a piece of jewelry, yes. it has to have value. Yes. And it's a yes. reason value. That's an investment. Mm -hmm. It's an investment. investment. So, so investment in finding money means leverage. Wow. Now, I'm going to end the segment, my segue with this is my story. Because I know George wants me to share my story. So I'm a four time cancer survivor. Amen. Amen. Last year, I was diagnosed four cancer, which is breast cancer, okay? So the blessing behind the leverage is that I had to take pretty much a year off work. And I was not eligible for Social Security disability because of my assets. And I was not eligible for long-term disability because the company I worked for didn't have short-term disability. And they don't want to pay you to be off work. They want you to go back to work. Yeah. And in order for me to actually go through this rabbit hole, they want to peel back your whole life and investigate your whole life. And if you, if you do that, you run into some other issues like my own girls. You have to really pick and choose your battles about being with disability. So I want to share that nugget with everyone. Well, I had the leverage to live off my own dime this past year. Amen. And Amen. although it was scary, mm. it was scary, I won't lie, I didn't allow that fear to stop me from doing that. Um, I, I was very obviously smart with my spending. I was mindful of my spending. Um, I knew where my money was going at all times. And I did put myself in a situation where you know, you know, I let my childhood trauma show, show up. The fear of being homeless, right? Because that little girl shows yes. up from time to time. Yes. 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 That little girl would, would show up. She, she, even, even when, when I was married, married that little girl, girl showed up often. The fear of being homeless mm -hmm. is, is, is real for me. Yes. But I, I really tried, tried to pray through that and meditate through that mm -hmm. and, and, and really rely on my abilities. But because I'm smart enough to really smart my money and also smart about what I asked for in my divorce, mm -hmm. I had the leverage to be able to heal this past year right. without worrying about being uh, forced to go back to work for too soon. I did that three other times. Mm -hmm. I went back, back to work too soon three other times mm -hmm. because of the fear of losing my job. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I came back, back to no job, job anyway, <laughs> right? Like, right. That, that happened in, in this process, and you know what? what? Hmm. I, I, I made it on the other side because of mm -hmm. financial leverage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But these were things like, like yeah. at this point, you have to stop saying, oh, we weren't taught this, we weren't taught mm -hmm. this. You have to say, I wasn't taught this, but I care enough to go learn that way. There's too many resources. 
resources out here in the internet is huge. And there are two people who want to share the knowledge. So at this point, we have to stop saying, you know, we have to stop being an ostrich and bear and saying, oh, we aren't taught, we don't know. Right? We have to go and find out because we could potentially be saving our own lives. And in this case, I literally saving my own life by doing this and being able to be out for a whole year. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. That's a good point. And I want to touch on that. And then. Because I think, I think money is, um, and I talk to my daughter about this all the time, um, because she's so very like night and day, but I, I, I try to tell her, um, stop looking at what society tells you about money. Yeah. That is evil, and it's this, it's that. Money is a tool. Yeah. Like all of that yeah. is what it is. Just, just like a hammer, yeah. just, just like a wrench, yeah. just like... Every, Every tool fits in the toolbox, box, and it's something that, that you need. And, and I love what you said, said about the leverage. leverage. Like, like that's even yes. a whole other way yes. because yes. that's exactly what it is, and, and we need it. Mm -hmm. And we can no longer say we weren't taught that. that. And, and so, so I'm just gonna leave it right there. there. And there, there is too much out here for us not to tap into it. And so we have to do better as people. And that is, I mean. I do everything I can to learn and to help others because that's how we grow. That's how we grow. So, 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 you know, and you share it with other people, people as you go say, you know, get blessed as well. So, so that's definitely. But I want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you. 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 Thank
I've, I've, I've got, got so, so much pain. Thank you, God. Yes, yes, Lord, Lord, God. But don't, don't get it twisted. But let me see what you want to be. Which one of you is a little bit of what she was talking about as far as cussing is concerned? Um, I, um, I didn't cuss too much, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, the mother of our church, and her name is Eva. Uh, <laughs> she said that she saw a vision of a person cussing. Mm. And it was fire coming out of their mouth. Wow. And when she told me that, it was, it was a picture. Like, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to look like that. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know. I'm mm -hmm. not perfect. I have so many flaws. Mm -hmm. And I ask God to help me with it. You know, and, and um, life is a journey. Yes. Every morning you get up. Yes. And say, Lord, I thank you for this day. Mm -hmm. And I look to my left, look out the window. I say, Lord, one more day, thank you. Yes. You know, that I'm above ground. You know, and, I don't know what you have in store for me. Mm -hmm. Watch before my mouth, yes. all of my steps. Mm -hmm. Then I may be a blessing to somebody. Amen. Um, and, you know, and I thank, I thank you. And I thank you for thank you for what you've had to say. Yeah. Oh, I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to use that. Thank you very much. Just a blessing. We were, we were not taught those things when we went to school. We were taught how to talk on the phone, mm -hmm. um, uh, public speaking. Um, like when we first um, had a place of our own, the light bill, how do you deal with this? Right. Yes. How do you do yes. it? Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, we didn't know that. You know. True. True. We True. knew True. that our parents True. dealt with that. You know, but, um, I thank God that we are learning. learning. And so we can't, we should say more about what we're talking about now. Yeah. And, yeah. and now I'm going to tell somebody else about it. Like my angel said, we know what I need you to do. Yes. <laughs> the mother of our church said that we're the same thing. You know what I need you to do. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you. God for, thank you for calling me mm -hmm. out of my comfort zone. <laughs> yes. Yes. God is good. Yes, yes. he is. I always say that. Do what I'm talking Yes. Stories, 
the, the laughter. Um, and, and I pray, pray that, that it will help someone, someone, that it will um, press someone to, to, to be amazing, amazing to, to do something different, to, to, to seek God, God to uh, whatever it is, whatever they get from, from this, I just pray that it gives them some nuggets and that it will nourish their soul in more ways than one because that's what it's all about. And so who knows where this will lead. Um, I'm just going to let like God take it and, and run with it, and that's what we're going to do. So I thank each and every one of you. I thank my awesome, awesome team over there, Randall and Angela. I thank y'all for opening up your home and um, for seeing the vision as well. I kind of see the pants person, and I was like, after we got off the phone, I just called Randall. And I was like, what did I do? <laughs> and so, but God is going to make a way. He's always does. And so I just want to thank you guys again. Um, give him all the glory, all the praise, and we'll see what happens. And y'all know what I always do. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in. Nourishing for the soul. Take care.